Katie can actually say what the, what the hell she wants anyway, because she's got over 100 caps and she's 35 years old. So she's an Whoa, old bird. She can just speak her mind. 34. 34? 34. Close. I might as well throw my notes out, out then. Burn them. Um, and, and Abby, you're actually quite an old head. I mean, I know you're only 27 and you've got 40-odd caps, but that's that's still enough to be called an <laughs> old head. You see your face looks old. <laughs> I do have an old head. An old these face. lot are weathering me. I'm spending too much time with these lot and they're, they're bringing my uh, my mental age up, unfortunately. Oh, Been around the block. Making you greater. But like you said, I'm only 27. I'm still young. I'm youthful. <laughs> Weathered. Weathered is the word. And I think when you when you spend a life in the row, the engine room, you're going to weather a lot quicker than others. Yeah, I just, this last hour, I've taken some more weather in, so. <laughs> um, yeah, is that, is that the reason you were late? Today, I mean, you, like I said, you guys are the talent. I've been sat here for 45 minutes waiting for you patiently. Uh, apparently training ran over and then Katie had to have a, a cold shower. It's because I was so excited to see you. That's what it was all about. Come on now. Uh, um, let's be honest. How was we it? All, how was training? on Katie's time. That's true. It's a perk of being a 10. Um, yeah, training was, was good. Yeah. Um, it's a different way for us. We've started using a bit more kind of fast paced tempo into our training rather than it being a bit more structured. It's a bit... I wouldn't say looser, but it's more... It's putting us under pressure That's so right. that when we're in a game scenario, actually we don't feel like we're under as much pressure because we train at such high intensity. So it's, it can be tough at times, but I think we get a lot out of it. So we actually are still trying to grow all the different ways and styles and um, abilities that we've got to play, whether that's, you know, kick, pass, run in yes. all different areas of the pitch. So actually, sometimes the focus isn't necessarily on the team we're playing. It's very much on us and kind of yeah developing that I think it's um I think it's quite a cool point because loads of people just use training uh this sounds really obvious for the sake of of training just to, to prepare for a game yeah. but not many teams that I've been involved with I've been involved with a couple that actually use training to better to push themselves and it's a really kind of uh forward way of thinking you think in a test week on a Wednesday on a Thursday to continue to push yourselves closer to a game uh, I think it, it, it only kind of comes through in your performance at the weekend. The the blueprint side of things, you, you're obviously a bit of a noise because you're a lock. You like to be organised. <laughs> you like to know what's going on. So um, cool. Coming from the tent. Hey, I'm all about free running rugby, man. Kick it. I just want to know, like, the quickest route and what's going to happen. So, you know, I don't know. But this, this is my question, right? So the game is full of those moments of control. But if you looked at the bulk of the game, everything that you plan for just gets ripped up and chucked out. And the game's just like turnover, turnover, you know, ball and play time's high. Um, are, are you kind of replicating training to to, to mimic that? Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. We play a lot with uh, multiple balls. So that we'll have a start point, but then halfway through, you know, multi-phase, another ball will come in and we'll shift and we'll be on that ball. So you think that you're coming around the corner and suddenly the opposition have it or it's been kicked behind us. And as a forward, you know what it's like when you just stood there watching them kick it, thinking... Oh, I wish you'd run. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I definitely think we're kind of replicating that in training. There's there's the... Um, when it, whenever that happened, when you got that like uh, kick tennis as a, as a forward, and especially as a fat lad in the middle of the field, I'd have the coach in the back of my head saying, you better be moving, you better be running, look busy. But realistically, you end up just running in a circle, standing in the same bloody point, wasting a whole lot of energy that you didn't need to do, but you need to look busy, you need to look busy. I've got to admit, which sometimes when reviewing footage, it is one of my favourite things to watch back, what happens to the forward, if it's gone at least like two, three kicks, and they are literally just running around in a little circle. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. You, you're a psychopath. You're a full-blown <laughs> psychopath. <laughs> so 2020 has been uh, mad crazy for a number of reasons, especially uh, in professional sport. It's been... Um, stop start but for you guys you've both had big life moments perspective is a is a wonderful thing like i think having like small people you just i was going to say can you please announce oh, to the, sorry, our, yeah. our listeners a little what happened little girl i think it just changes everything like you'll know the rugby sometimes can be is your everything and i think for me she's given me just a massive outlet and just a bit of perspective about like it's great and i want to be the best but also to come home and switch off and just enjoy enjoy sp spending time with her and we love it because whenever we're on a zoom call and, <laughs> and, and Addie's there we're like oh let's see Addie like Katie get out of the way yeah, that's literally the story of my life now yeah um do, do you find it harder now you're kind of uh I suppose full time with with what you're doing 
and not kind of balancing teaching because you're a teacher right yeah, yeah. I try, so yeah. You, you're not balancing teaching playing and family and friends whereas now you're kind of like mum and a rugby player uh, is, or is, is that harder I think sometimes it can be harder I think like like she has no concept of like time so if she wants to get up at half a six and that's it your day starts then and like obviously we're still in a position our clubs are more evening so our main club session will still be on a an evening so it might be like uh seven till half eight seven till nine so as much as it's like it's great for us because we get to go into the day and get all our bits but our girls still work so like for me i just find sometimes that my day really is extended a little bit i'm like i just want to lie in <laughs> just want to be great and then you just Madness. getting plucked away in camps as well yeah and i think it's hard being away it's much harder leaving now uh, and as, as she's got more away and a bit older I, I do yeah. find it hard being away for long periods I, of time. I can relate to that. I, I remember actually towards the end of, of my playing career going away, whenever I kind of got this tracksuit out or packed this bag, uh, my, my little girl would be like, oh, you, you're going to the rugby hotel. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm off to the rugby hotel. And do you know what? Um, it was such an intense environment. One of, the, one of the sort of light at the end of the tunnel for me in a, in a test week was like I obviously wanted to play the game and I wanted to do well and win and all that but it was literally seeing my family after the game for that brief sort of half hour hour encounter that you'd get at a at a function or because we always had like a, a dinner after a game and you know kids at dinners just don't work um all, all these sorts of things so that was like my one sort of driver was to get through the weeks just so I could see my family um but yeah I think it's tough as well, like with, with COVID and everything that we're, we're in a bubble. So even if we're away for like a week or two weeks at a time, you'd have down days that you might see yeah. your friends, your family, your other halves and, and go and kind of decompress and um, relax a little bit. Whereas we can't do that um, at the moment. Once we're in our bubble, we're, we're in for, for the whole period. So I think that is that can be tough too. Do, do you think having like a focus away from rugby makes you better like a better round of person better player yeah 100 percent. yeah like i say i think for me the, the best bit is the perspective of it like i think i would have probably previously gone if we would had a, a rubbish session gone home and like looked over it and want to really understand it whereas now you get through the door and it's like i want to go play i want to go and like see what she's been doing or like interact with her and the, the rugby bit i think it probably makes my much more, it makes me much more of a balanced person, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think it's balanced. Like, I go through the door, and then actually, and instead Dave of me runs. reviewing it, Dave reviews it. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to come to you now, Abby. So, your, your news, I'll let you announce your news. Yeah, so I got married at the end of August, so I'm now Abby Ward. She didn't just uh, change her name. Wardy, Scotty, same thing though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Thank um, you. So, yeah, you, your, your husband is actually a rugby coach, and uh, obviously an uh, ex-professional player. So, do you get grilled at home? No, um, we discuss things, or we'll probably disagree a lot on things. I'll be like, what about this call? And he'll be like, no, like, the hooker, this. So we, we always have the uh, caller-hooker argument a lot in terms of who, whose fault it is, why something didn't come off. Obviously, I'm always saying it's the hooker. He's always saying it's the caller. Um, but no, it's like Katie said, it's just so nice to have that balance. Um, and I think... Sorry, I've got to disagree with you you're talking about balance but like your other half's a rugby coach so yeah, where's your balance so he's a rugby coach he's a rugby player but he's also he's been there and now he's like he's transitioning out of his playing to coaching um or you know he works um in in schools as well and so he it's nice to come back and be like this wasn't quite right or this wasn't working and he can be like look relax you need to deal with it this way or have you thought about this or just actually forget about it you've got an, another week next week go in and for now, like, let's not talk rugby. And we do have days where it's like, no rugby. Don't even want to think about it. Don't want to like talk about it, watch it, get out of rugby kit and, uh, and yeah. Brilliant. Well, how did, that, how did that work with COVID? Because COVID was bloody miserable for a lot of people. So did you see a window and just and, and make for the, the church when, when you got a... Yeah, we, well, it was originally um, planned for the end of June, which obviously we were in full lockdown at that point. So we moved it to the end of August. But with our calendar, everything was so crazy. Yeah. We really didn't know when we'd get an opportunity. And it was in that little dip where they went from six people in a church to 30. So we had 30 in there, which was all our like friends, family, bridesmaids, groomsmen. Um, and then... I think a couple of days later they went back down to six or to two people so we kind of got away with that in terms of um, having 
you know, the real focal people that we wanted there, the really important people. Um, and yeah, I guess it's, I think we're lucky that we were able to get it, to get it done, to, to have, have our wedding. And I think with so much uncertainty, I think we, um, yeah, we're really glad we did. Oh, brilliant. Congratulations. I'm going to bounce back to you, uh, Katie, at the ripe old age, uh, the experienced mature age of 34, not 35. What, what's keeping you, what's keeping you going? Because obviously, you I was... what's keeping you here? <laughs> no, this, it's, this it's a valid interview. question yeah. because you, you must have people uh, chomping at the bit, pushing you. Um, I, I finished when I was 33 and I was being pushed continuously and my body basically gave up in the end. Uh, I had a couple of kind of key motivating motivations. Um, I, I wanted to make Japan, uh, all these sorts of things. Um, what, what's keeping you going? Because as you get older, right, I can imagine the game becomes easier, but also harder. What, what's, what's, what's motivating you? Um, I think there's, there's always been two things for me. Like I'm fiercely competitive. So I, I always want to be the best at what I do. And I've always played rugby because I loved it or because I love it. Um, and they always, they were always my, all my always two markers. I, I've played long before we became professional. So my, my motivations in the game have always been pretty simple and, and they would be the two things. And I think as long as I've got something to offer and I can still feel like I'm, like you say, the, 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 the cusp of when your body starts to, starts to go, I think for me, I probably will, I'm at that point where that's going to be the next thing that hits me. You know, you, you always want to be as an athlete, keep going and going. And I'm probably like there now and the next bit's going to be here. Um, and also if I'm enjoying the game, which I am, um, as of yet, Mids hasn't tapped me on the shoulder and said, um, I think you need to... Jump before you push. Yeah, like, off you go. So, and, and like you say, I, I really like that competitive element. So the likes of Zoe Harrison, Helena Rowland, that's what you want for the England shirt. You, you want it to be competitive. And not that there hasn't been a lot of competition, but I think there, this is like real competition for me. And it, it's interesting to see where it will go. Like, all I can do for me, and, and it's the beauty of age as well, is that I can just keep being me and being the best. I don't have that, like what I had when I was younger, that kind of constant edge about it. I'm like, well, the time will come and it's probably going to come sooner rather than later now. So actually I might just just enjoy these opportunities. And hopefully, like I say, when the time has come, they'll kind of give me an, hey, off you go. Don't don't bother uh, coming next week. If they don't, I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if not. I, I appreciate your honesty, but like if Mids is watching, you've got to be saying like, I feel I'm here and I feel like I can still get here. I'm going to yeah. keep pushing and keep pushing. <laughs> yeah, but I think that hopefully my training does that. He doesn't need like the, the chat from me. He can he can watch me outside and be like, he, he can see that. And I think for me, Dylan, I, if I'm not enjoying the game, it is, ve it is very obvious. I'm not maybe particularly great at hiding what I feel. Uh, so I think as soon as that, when that happens, Scotty is laughing because she knows it's true. But uh, it will be very obvious. You're like a, a trailblazer in a way. Um, I spoke to, to Amy about this the other day. Uh, and, and Beckett because like you've worked you've played all over the show you've balanced you've juggled you've you've been semi-pro you've been to the Olympics you've done all these things you've been to the palace you've got an MBE congratulations but do you feel like you're trailblazing and now that you've got an opportunity to be like full-time pro um, you want to max that out as well? Oh yeah I think it's definitely like we've got this opportunity now so I want to enjoy it but I also wouldn't change any of the journeys I've been on like you say like being semi-pro uh, the opportunity to go and play like both codes play 15s and 7s like the opportunities I've had in my career have been absolutely phenomenal we used to play we used to go to Dubai 7s in December and come back and play Six Nations in January February um, so I, I got to do the I got to live the best of both worlds in the game. I think probably maybe Scotty and the girls definitely younger than her now will just come in as a, a full time professional, and that will also have its pros. But for me, I, I wouldn't change the like, the good old days. <laughs> yeah, Abby, you're going to get the boring the boring professional side of it. Yeah, but I think it's like you you list off all those accolades, and it's mental to think that like she's had seasons away playing sevens, and it's that experience which like the younger players and myself to have that on the pitch is you know it's it's amazing. We get a lot from it, and Katie she'll play it down and she'll be like, oh, I just really enjoy it, and you know, but she's. Her standard, I think it's getting better. Everyone talks about you, you're up there, but you're still improving. And if she wasn't improving, then I think you those conversations would be had, but they're not they're not needed to have because because of what you're putting out. So yeah. Abby, you've had a few injury injury setbacks. Um, tell us a little bit about um, I don't know, 
I know what the answer is going to be because um, I've obviously had my injury setbacks. But um, your kind of motivation there, um, you listed off some of those accolades that, that Katie's got. Are you kind of, do you see her as an aspirational kind of figurehead? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to. I don't think I'll get anywhere near um, Ooh, in terms of, you know, some of the stuff that she's achieved, but you, you can only push for it. That's all you can do. Um, again, like my position, I think there's so much talent coming through and it's highly competitive. So all I can do is try and get hold of the shirt and then keep it for the next game and the next game. Uh, it's frustrating, obviously, like with injuries, being out for periods of time, but the the team doesn't stop whilst you're out. Everything keeps moving and they keep gaining momentum. So you've just got to make sure when you come back in, you can kind of hit the ground running, get back on that, that train that England is on um, and kind of work your way back into the team. Do you, do you um, this happened to me a couple of times uh, with disciplinaries uh, and injury. You know, when you're out of that, that environment, that setup that you're in there, it really hurts. Like you think the team's like continuing and doing and having fun and winning and being just that England team and you're missing out. How, how hard has it been for you uh, when you haven't been involved? Having that balance, having, you know, your home life. I think that definitely helped in this last year. Um, I think previously I've been out for, there's been twice where I've been out for like a nine month and a, and a year um, time. And I think that was, that was a lot harder um, because your focus has been solely rugby and then you've got nothing else to kind of distract you from that or to give you perspective. Whereas I think this time around, um, I mean, I was probably busy just trying to plan a wedding during COVID, which, is, <laughs> which definitely keeps you busy. But I think there is more perspective there, but then there's also, I think that increases your drive too. Um, and I'm not sure about you, like with your injuries coming back and with your family behind you, you, you kind of want it even more. Yeah, I, I think there's a difference because um every injury that i got like and and our listeners need to probably accept that rugby produces injuries like it's it goes part and parcel it's what we accept as as professional sports people um you're going to get injured but like my whole career whenever i got injured or i had some sort of setback i knew i could come back from it like and culturally uh you just accept it don't you it is what it is and you look at it, you go six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is, I can be back on the field then and I'll make sure I'm back and I'm better and I'm stronger. Never faster for me. But um, I think the hardest thing was, is when I was 33, I started to realize that I couldn't get back better, stronger, certainly not faster. And I actually, for the first time, and it's the only time ever in my career, I thought I might not be able to get back from this. And when that self-doubt kind of creeps in, and Katie, you said this before, the fear of not being able to compete anymore, that's where it really hit home. Like, I went and watched the boys train today, uh, privileged enough to be kind of invited into camp. And I had that innate kind of within me thing to, to go and compete. And I, I'm like, I could still do that. But physically, when you have an injury that doesn't allow you to perform or compete how you once knew you could, that's really like mentally challenging. So I think you know when it's time, basically. But um... I agree. And I think like also during to like have an injury during a period where there's lockdown, like you've got no physios, you've yeah. got no teammates to do the running sessions with or like you return to contact. Like it is tough, but I think that's where like I think everyone as a, as a country, but as separate communities, whether that's a rugby community or whatever kind of scenario it's in, has come together. So actually, we've been in more contact during lockdown, yeah, like in terms of speaking up, checking in, catching up with everyone, making sure that everyone does feel part of it than I think previously we may have. I, I think that's probably the best thing about the, the environments that we've all been involved with is that it's almost like the infrastructure, the facilities, the, the, the people, the access that you have to physios, osteo, um, like the rehab facilities, the recovery, like when you've got all that, it's easy to come back from that stuff. So I can imagine having an injury during lockdown was was murder. Like I knew a couple of boys that were kind of getting knee reconstructions and stuff like that and doing uh, Zoom call physio sessions. Yeah. You had that though, didn't um, you? Like, yeah, Dave was my physio. So they did a Zoom call about how he was going to do like my soft tissue and some mobs. And I'd be like, right, come on physio. And yeah, it was interesting. Some interesting uh, 
physio, but uh, it works, so I can't complain. And you're back in great form. What about, what about New Zealand coming up um, next summer? What, what's your guys' sort of um, thought process? Are you, are you very much going to give me the, the here and now, this weekend focus, or is it kind of in the back of your mind? No, I definitely think the training that we've touched on that like you you talked about it being forward thinking, but I think a lot of the the kind of planning behind this is a long term. So this Wednesday and this fast paced precious training is a lot about the future and like next year's Six Nations. So I think the 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 boys have definitely taken on board that about like actually we need to start that now because actually we'll get our gains then. Um, and I think that's probably it's quite refreshing for I think from us because I think exactly what you touched on the before is that when you get into test week or when you get into match week, almost like all your training goes out the window because it's all about prepping for that game. Uh, and I think we've probably previously as England f- fallen into that a little bit, a little bit of grooving. Whereas now actually I think yeah. you're starting to see some of people's individual um, skill sets that they wouldn't necessarily get opportunity to show if we went into that. And I think for me, it's re- it is really refreshing in, in terms of the build-up going yeah. forward. I think, like, obviously it'll always be kind of in the, the back of some people's minds or everyone's minds, really. But at the same time, because literally our weeks can change from day to day about what is going on because of COVID, because of games, whether they're being called on or called off, or we were due to have a to go over to New Zealand, which obviously changed. So I think... Also, it's trying to get your head around like what's happening week to week at the minute. Yeah. Oh, you guys are polished. You're so good. I know you both want to be there next year, but um, I think the reality is uh, it's how you perform day to day and, and week to week, isn't it? And um, I think genuinely for the first time, like Scotty said, there is a little bit of doubt of like, will the tournament go ahead? And, like you, we, we thought like COVID would be a much shorter event. It's had such impact on, not just on sport, but obviously on people's lives as well. And I think like Scott, you said, you, you do have that as an, as an athlete as about kind of what's best for you, what's best for your family, what's best for the, the population as a whole as well. It, sometimes it is a little bit bigger than just about rugby. And I think that is something that definitely, again, is an older player you are more aware of. You know, 2017, is that a motivational sort of, factor for you guys going forward yeah I I found that very very hard um especially like afterwards um and can still kind of put myself back in those shoes quite quickly and think about it and I think about it a lot so I think for me personally there is huge huge motivation and especially with losing out to New Zealand and the next um the next tournament obviously being over there in their back backyard is I think it's a great challenge what what a great place to go like I love the fact that um, you, 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 you envisage yourself being there going forward just appreciate every kind of opportunity you get because after 2011 I thought I'd be able to redeem that performance I'd be able to approach another tournament give it the due respect that it deserved and go and win one I thought I'd, I'd have my moment but it's funny how like the, the rugby gods work um, so I, I don't need to tell you this Katie but you just got to appreciate every every game as they come because you, you truly don't know when, when your last game is no, going to be. It. I think um, you're absolutely right. Because like this time last year, I was playing fully fit and then didn't play again until, what, September? Yeah. And thought, thought I'd be playing the next week, thought I'd be out for two weeks. And I can definitely appreciate that, you know, a lot of things can happen within a year. Change very quickly. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, after you guys, because um, everything's good when, you, when you're winning, right? You know, after you, you lose... As, as kind of, I'm going to refer to you both as senior players or experienced players, how, how, do, you, how do you cope? How do you, how do you react? How do you act? Well, me and Katie played for many years together. We did. Um, up at DMP, down to Malden Park. And we, I think, suffered quite a few losses. That's fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? I think you've got two sides. Like Scott said, Wardy. Sorry, I get it wrong every time. Uh, sorry, Dave. Um, as a senior player, there's almost like an expectation that you react in a, a certain way. But I think ultimately, like, it, it hurts. And sometimes, I, I think sometimes you, you want to... Not people want you to react in a, in a different way without sometimes all the emotion that comes with it. And I think also... I answer the question at all, though. It depends on why why you've lost you can go out onto a pitch put everything out there have you know play in all the right areas execute everything that you wanted to execute 
But if you've been beaten by a better team, <coughs> you've been outplayed, you just don't have the talent that an opposition might have, then I think you can almost take that loss with the, your head held high. I think we've also been into games probably where we should have won and maybe through pure, pure execution or decision making um, or discipline you've lost the game and I think those are the ones which you really kind of yeah, they're the hard ones on the, the hard ones to take the ones that you should have won and you didn't yeah then yeah. yeah I agree do you know what I, I think it, it's good to be uh, upset frustrated um, but what I learned is that especially as a, as a captain and as a senior player or an experienced player people look to you and on how you conduct yourself and you basically you're setting the tone along with the coach you know if the coach is kind of calm the changing room will be calm if the coach is wound up everyone else will think if the coach is wound up I've got a bit you know I'm going to mimic those sort of or if he's sad or if he's happy so I, I kind of learned like even after a win or a loss was almost just be consistent you got to figure out why you lose but I don't think there's any point in putting your head in your hands because you look over to a 19 20 year old that doesn't know how to act they're going to put their head in their hands because you're doing it so I, I think one of the hardest things was uh, especially as a captain after a loss was to kind of put your jacket on, put your shoulders back, pick your head up and just, you know, bring the same energy on a Sunday and a Monday that you would do if you'd won. I, I think that was like the biggest challenge um, that I had because I tell you what, you, you're talking about your club. Um, forgive me. Where's my notes? Bowden. Something, <laughs> something. Darlington. Come on. <laughs> Darling, we can go back to this. You're better than this. Darlington Mowden Park. We played there back together back what, 2013, 14, 15. There we go. All right, stop reminiscing. My point is, right, you guys lost some games up there. I, I played at Northampton where I think we lost like 12 in a row. Imagine like trying to be consistent with your, your energy on a Monday. Not, not after three losses, not after four, but after like 12, it was like, just be consistent. Just I think keep that's, going. Um, it's funny because at England, like a lot of people think, oh, England win every game. Like they don't know what it is like to lose. And actually we go back to club week in, week out and we have really tough games and we do, we do have defeats and we do have losses and we have hard fought games. And I think it's sometimes it's important to acknowledge that. It's not just plain sailing, I yeah. promise you. It's, it's funny. Um, because I obviously sit in a, in a media seat now and I see people's reactions to, to wins and losses. And um, people forget that the game really hurts. Like you pour so much emotion, physical and mental application into that game. And I did actually find when I won, I wasn't as sore. But when we lost, I was really sore physically. Like it just hurt so much more. And I'd sit there, I'm like, is it worth it? Is it worth it? But for when you win, it it's 100% worth it. Um, right, we talked about the miserable stuff. What about winning, celebrating yeah, your I wins? Thought this, um, I thought this was meant to be like a cheery. good crack, a yeah. bit of fun. Oh, <laughs> it's been very geez, all right. slamming, slamming you there. Well, you were supposed to bring the crack. I'm just a facilitator. So it's something to do with the talent. It's your end. Um, talk to me um, about winning then, celebrating success. How do, how do you do it? You've just done a back-to-back -back Grand Slam. How did you do it? Yeah, well, it was a bit different, wasn't it? Because you can't exactly was it? I don't know. go out and celebrate like you would do. We were in our hotel in Italy, um, confined to two rooms that we could share, um, distanced. So, yeah, there was, there was a, few, a few drinks. We've got to celebrate. We've got to acknowledge like, what's been achieved. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think on previous wins, it's been a bit more rowdy or we've gone out the following day um, or night, whereas we couldn't quite do that. Yeah, it was very, it was difficult, wasn't it? Previously, we've had friends and family as well. And I think just having like, they are massively part of our journey and part of who we are. And just to have that's almost like an opportunity for them to celebrate as well. So it's not just about like us, it's about everybody. And I think that was probably hard. Like the girls that had played in the tournament previously weren't there. Some of the staff, we'd had change over staff. So there's like a lot of people that potentially played in that last Italy game. Some had not been involved, some had been, and you had every spectrum. So like myself, I'd not been in a single Six Nations game and obviously it was won the week She just before. came for the big ones. Yeah, came for the Literally, big ones. Literally, came for the medal. Um, and there's players oh, Big that games, haven't... big players. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Med's That's got a ready, he just needed Man the, of the, match, the big... big players. <laughs> But yeah, it's tough because you also feel for those girls that are at home that can't celebrate with you, that you'd normally yeah, want to be strange, like, come on, we're a squad effort. This is, you know, 
it's not just one team one day that wins it it's over a period of time and yeah we couldn't quite yeah do they're that. at home while you guys are getting those photos and posting on instagram <laughs> development in the women's game um especially for you katie how have you seen change where where have you seen change and especially being a playmaker it's gone to color tv <laughs> Yeah, we were kit that fits us. Um, oh, I mean, the change is huge, absolutely huge in the in the women's game in terms of the overall quality of the game from the league up, like well, even before you get to international. But I just think the the skill level of the girls, you know, like once upon a time your wingers were just quick girls that come from athletics and they could catch a ball and they were quick, and that's pretty much it without being rude. Yeah. But I think now you've got wingers that. You look at Jess and Abby, both are athletic, they're quick, they've got handling games, very good defenders. Uh, you've got forwards that are now like so much more than just a carrying, a carrying player. They can ball play, they're athletic, they move around. I think just that the overall brand of the game, women's game, for me is so much better and it's so much more enjoyable. I think we're still at a, a point now where the pitch is a good size, so you still get edges, you still get gaps. Um, it hasn't become just about like kicking and I think probably the guys game at the moment is basically just about big guys running really really are very physical running into each other I think the women's game is still probably like got that little interest intricacy of small passes tips and and players that can um utilize the space around them okay what about like the the media side of it you know Abby I've seen you you've done quite a bit of media stuff you're a bit of a pin-up you've got a few sponsors and well stuff like you that. know what right. it's like on this on the sideline it's our agent deals. Like we've got the same agent. They, they, you know, Ryan, he does a good job. Yeah, all those female appearances I can't do, uh, they get handed over to you. Yeah. And now we know where this is going. What? I yeah. can just leave Where's it. Where's it going? You two just want to have a convo. No, I, I, I genuinely, I, I want to know about like, um, like media coverage, um, you know, games, uh, TV, like even, even this sort of stuff. I, I think for, for you guys, it's brilliant. Like I referred to you as a trailblazer before or the trailblazers, like you're in a position now where you've got 18, 19 year olds that are playing club rugby and they could be tossing up like university uh, along with playing professional rugby as, as a viable sort of career choice, you know? And I think just having visible sort of role models for, for me as, as a dad, for my daughter is brilliant. So the, the more sort of media coverage, the more, we can get you guys out there and grow the game. I, I think I think it's brilliant. To be fair though, like I start, I got capped in two thousand seven. It was at OAs, and I think there was a hundred people there, if that. And the majority of that hundred people were friends and family. It wasn't covered anywhere. Um, there was no, nothing like online or in papers or anything. And you think now, like the last game at home, it, um, the Stoop, it was a, a record crowd. It was live on Sky. It's being there's a highlights package. We're speaking to you, and that's in like ten years. I think the the change in the game is the interest as well is absolutely huge because, like you say, it's about being accessible. So people now have a choice to make. They can put on women's rugby, and they might not be a fan. It might surprise them, or they they, they might then be thinking actually. And I think in terms of the bigger picture as well, it's so important for investment. So our club games will be streamed now and actually to have that amount of people watch it will suddenly businesses, company want to invest. And that just helps us as players, whether that provides money for S&C or for nutrition or psychology or kit. And actually then we can create an even better brand of rugby. And again, it's just that circle. Do you, do you feel like there's a pressure on you guys to to or responsibility to to make it a success to keep pushing? Yeah, I definitely do. I think it's it's huge for our game. I think we're in a point now where we can the Red Roses can really really step up and to have its kind of a following and a, and a brand that, like you say, for your daughter can either aspire to be one or even just wants to be something like, oh, dad, can you take me and we can go do this? And I think for us, it's it's a huge responsibility because I, I never had that. I wanted to be like Johnny Wilkinson when I grew up and that was my only role model that I knew or Sally Gunnell, who was a 400 meter runner and I was never ever going to be a hurdler. I was never going to be that. So I think the opportunity well, for young girls is, it's huge, isn't I, it? I think rugby is cheaper than a pony. So, <laughs> well, um, but I think we, we've also got a responsibility outside of the rugby world and actually just females <laughs> in general and kind of aspiring athletes and other sports to show what, what we can achieve, what we can achieve as a brand, as you know, rugby, as a show, getting spectators there, getting support there and hopefully um, push other sports to do the same or other countries to do the same. And I think just bring everything up with us. 
do you do you think um, you know fast forward 10 years what what sort of athlete we're going to see do you think it's going to change do you think it's going to evolve I think I'm not sure. Honestly. I think it will. I think I think you'll it'll follow kind of maybe the the, the the trend of the men. Like you guys have got bigger and bigger, haven't you? Now you look at the size. Well, I was a dying breed. I was like the old school pub player, and I even like, when you were training. Tra training today, like I looked at all the guys, but oh, my old mate Jamie George, he's still flying the flag. Mucko's still flying the flag for the the big boys, but you know they've still got skills and they're explosive athletes, but. Like the player, even from when I finished, is still evolving. It, it's it's like this power athlete. It's ridiculous. But it's like all um, the props have so six packs. Where, where did that? Where how did that happen? But I think as probably people get S and Cs and nutritionists get more, the knowledge increases, doesn't it? Then they get another step up, and that it changes the kind of the way the game's played. And and I think in terms of rugby as well, we were talking about um, the rugby players, the difference of them coming through. I feel like we've got a lot more naturally gifted rugby players because they've been playing from such a young age and they know everything about the game. It's just so kind of, um, I don't know, they just get it second nature to them. Part of what they've done, isn't it? Very Instinctive. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's instilled. It's not the sort of thing that they've picked up like at university or Which would have been previous, later in life. Yeah. And I think, I think like if you sit fast forward to 10 years, like a success for, for me would be more girls playing from a younger age so they have that and that and i think that's not that's naturally what's going to happen because the accessibility in clubs is like that you've got under 13s you've got under 15s you've got under 18s girls so you've got a really nice smooth transition which then allows them to come into adult rugby and then the aspirations of playing aliens 15s and then international and kind of a much easier pathway than probably that we had do you do you think you're in an advantage as a as an england player um compared to the the, the club players Oh yeah. yeah, huge, huge. Well, for a start, we're full time, so we don't have to worry about, you know, getting up, doing our gym at six in the morning to go and work nine till five and then come back. So we have so much more recovery time, downtime, but also time to do like all the analysis and all that noisy stuff that you were talking about um, and just get that extra level of detail in terms of execution or what we're trying to do that the other players they don't get so they can never really take their game to that next level they can never really build in terms of game plan or um i guess that detail and i think for like for me when we talk about the future that the hope is that the clubs start maybe start to go somewhat as a semi professional so because i think that's then the next step to for the league is that you get all clubs or the majority of clubs are having a semi-professional programme so these girls aren't having to juggle like what we did. And that's that's why like the media is so important. We get that coverage, we get those supporters and then people want to invest and then suddenly instead of a, a club, we're so lucky at Quinns that we've got, you know, eight England girls, we've got lots of internationals and the rest, you know, are working full time. Actually, can we have the clubs that have a whole squad of full time players? Brilliant. Uh, you got to be careful what you wish for as well. If it's all of a sudden, people you know that they're full time pro. People are going to be gunning for those contracts. People are going to be coming for you. Yeah, you, you, have, to, I, I you have to raise your game. Point, I'll be done. I think they are already. To be fair, like we've been over. Yeah, our numbers do you, done. Do you, do you, do you sometimes sit there and like pinch yourselves and think like how cool is it to say you're a full time athlete? Yeah, I think you definitely do. But that's also why you know you've got to work so hard because it's not like the men's that. OK, if you if you don't get offered a renewal of a contract at one club, you can maybe go and see if you can get one elsewhere. It's almost like all or nothing. So you, you've got to work so hard to try and get a contract or get an extension or compete with those people, because if not, it'll be like, OK, let's go back to the day job and then try and compete to regain a contract whilst working. Yeah. And I think like you took Mids was talking about today, just the quality of players that we now have. So I think previously you probably maybe had like 20, 25 players that were like probably contracts were, were guaranteed. And I think now that that's like Scotty said, that's not the case. There's 30, 35 players that you're like, actually, we could contract all of them. So the only thing you can control as an individual is like making sure you you're in the best shape in the, and playing as well as possible. Well, uh, I think we're going to round it up there. You get to ask me a question. So, yeah, it's your turn. What was your first cap song? Uh, and can we have a rendition? Well, it's, I sang a crowd pleaser. 
uh, You Never Close Your Eyes. Oh, go on then. That No, I'm not yeah. a singer and I'm not an entertainer. I'm a facilitator and a respected on, media host. Come on, Keep clicking. Not respected. He's going to break. You guys are 45 minutes late and now you're trying to make me sing? Yeah, yeah, come on. Have no, I'll tell you another oh, story Dylan. though. Come on, Dylan. You've got this. The same, the on. same day. Stop clicking. I'm going to no. mute you. I can mute you. Yep, I'm in control. You're um, Jason Leonard brought me a pint of white wine, which I had to down. Uh, I ended up tackling Martin Johnson into the side of the bus. Um, I actually slept all the way home on the bus. And when I got back, um, I don't know if you've ever... Exp do you have to wear... Um, do you have to wear... Do ladies wear cufflinks? No. no. Surprisingly. No. Um, I got back to the, uh, the hotel... Um, blind drunk, got to my room, managed to get one cufflink off. Stop doing that. I'm trying to tell another really good story. <laughs> and I couldn't get the other cufflink off. So I stood on the shirt and I pulled it and I ripped the whole sleeve off my, my shirt. And because I was only 21 at the time, I was so embarrassed and I was scared of telling anyone. I remain like the, the further four games of the, the Autumn Internationals, I had like a one shirt, uh, one sleeve shirt. And after every game, um, I used to try and get the shirt on before like any of the team management could see that I've ripped my shirt and I'd have to keep my jacket on all night, which meant I was honking hot. Right, girls, this is the feature. It's called The Greatest. Um, I want you to alternate. Um, I want you to tell me what your greatest is. So, Abby, we're going to start with you. Yep. Your greatest <laughs> takeaway. Dominoes. Why? Oh, just love oh, it. Just get me a Domino's, a large one, half and half, pepperoni, like a bit of ham, barbecue sauce on one side, normal on the other. Happy days. Garlic dip? No. What? That's the only reason I get purist Domino's. Pizza. Purist pizza girl. <laughs> um, Katie Daly McLean, the greatest celeb you've ever met? Other than you? The qu Surely the Queen. Did you she meet the Queen? She wasn't the Queen. It was... Uh, Princess Anne. Oh, she's pretty great. She was great though. And I tell you what, totally impressive because there was a hundred people who got it, uh, an award on that day and she knew something about everybody. And I, she, I, she likes she likes her rugby, right? Yeah, she did. She does. Yeah, she so really you're in it. there. But was, was that the greatest for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you can't really top royalty, let's be honest. Well, you can. Well, I Subjective. Mean, Subjective. No. Jude Law was pretty oh, great. All right. All right. Jude Law. <laughs> Where did you meet Jude Law? Here we well, go. Just obviously on a red carpet last year, at the Marvel film premiere. You know, I only got to go because as uh, Sarah Hunter's plus one, they really wanted her, and I was just like the tag along. It's a good one wow. to tag along to. Yeah, yeah, it's not bad. Um, Daniel Radcliffe was really nice. Harry Potter, I quite like Harry Potter as well, so that's a good one. Abby, greatest way, greatest way to relax. I'm gonna say a little go on the Xbox. What? Not a hot bath. No, um, a little Xbox session with the girls. There's a few of us in camp and we'll just have a little. <laughs> what, what's play? Call of Duty. So we've got uh, me, Marley Packer, Poppy oh, Cleo, um, Hannah Bottomman and Sarah Byrne. We're the gamers, known as the gamers. To Who's themselves. the best? The greatest. Uh, I you mean, they do call me in if they can't complete a level, so. Yeah. I mean, what, what sort of level are we talking here? Are you talking Luke Cow and Dickie good? Like, he, he, he got on the top three in the world at one point at Call of Duty. Yeah, definitely nowhere near that. So we, we don't want it's to organise like a head-to-head. -head. I mean, I think it would be interesting. Maybe us, all of our gamers against him. Let's make this happen, right? Online streaming, appealing to a new audience. Done. Easy. Christmas song, both of you. The Pogues, Ooh, Fairy Tale of New York. I love Christmas. I like driving home for Christmas, play it on repeat whilst I drive home, which is like seven hours away. Um, <laughs> Dave must be delighted. <laughs> yeah. Driving home for Christmas. Sound like that. Yeah, they're all, they're all great, aren't they? Love Christmas. Can't uh, wait. When's it acceptable to start playing? First of December. Like, first of December. I'll push it. I'll try and get in there, like, before December. Do you guys do, um, do you do, like, Secret Santa and stuff like that at, at club stuff? Yeah, well, we're doing one within like a few of us at England. This, they've been forced into it. So it's the gamers and then we bring in the old heads like... You don't Katie, have many friends. So Emily Scarra, Sarah Hunter, Mo Hunt. Um, so yeah, that's... Sounds, very sounds really exclusive, actually. We, we used to do like, um, like pick it out a hat secret centre and then we'd have a team meeting where everyone would have to open in front of the room.
uh, and it was all anonymous, obviously. I can imagine, uh, are your gifts really thoughtful? Oh, it depends. Mm. If Poppy Ple if Poppy Gleal's getting you a gift, it's or not going to be thoughtful. It's yeah. going to be, yeah. Right, ladies, thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. I wish you well for the rest of the season, and I hope you have a lovely Christmas. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks, 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 thanks. Thanks. It was great. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs>